All around us, and even in our own families, we see very visible signs that our traditional family structure is changing. Simply put, no longer can we stereotype the family as two parents with children and only one parent working. Many important social and economic changes have impacted the family structure, and consequently, the family unit faces new problems and challenges. From the campuses of The Ohio State University, Columbus, and Iowa State University, Ames, this is a live video teleconference. Today's program, Research in Family Life. Presentations and discussions of recent research findings by faculty and staff from the College of Home Economics, Ohio State, and the College of Consumer and Family Science, Iowa State. Topics today will focus on the family stress process and several adolescent concerns. Good morning. I'm Ruth Canoni, Assistant Director for Extension Home Economics with the Ohio Cooperative Extension Service. This morning, we're making history. This is the first video teleconference to be duly uplinked from two land-grant universities, having researchers from those universities share their research results across the entire nation in one broadcast. We're very excited that Iowa State is cooperating with Ohio State in this new innovative venture. We look forward to doing more of these kinds of programs in the future. In Ohio, Governor Celeste has proclaimed November as Family Life Month and programs will be conducted around the state using research-based information in the family life area throughout the month of November especially. We're excited about this special emphasis because we recognize the very extreme importance of family life education for the citizens of Ohio and of the United States. The American Home Economics Association has approved two professional development units for those of you who view this program either live or who view the videotape following the teleconference. Information will be on the screen later for how you might enroll for those professional development units. One of the exciting advantages of doing a live satellite broadcast is that you, the viewers, have the opportunity to ask questions of our researchers. You will have toll-free numbers on your screen shortly that you can call. If you want to ask questions of the three researchers at Ohio State University, and you are in Ohio, you need to call 1-800-221-6237. If you are anywhere in the United States and wish to call our researchers at Ohio, you need to call 1-800-433-3946. Do prepare your questions as you listen to the research reports because our researchers are looking forward to hearing from you. Shortly, we'll be back to introduce our topics, but first, we're going to Iowa State and moderator Roger Brown. Thanks very much, Dr. Canoni. We appreciate it very much. And uh, we're also very excited to be part of this uh, dual uplink from two land-grant universities, not too many miles apart, and uh, uh, certainly together as far as, uh, as thinking goes, I think. Uh, we uh, can be reached from anywhere in the country on this 800 number. If you'd like to talk to the researchers from Iowa State University, call 1-800-255-2255, extension 1409. I'll repeat that. That's 1-800-255-2255, extension 1409. I'd like to introduce the uh, researchers here in the studio with me at Iowa State University. Uh, first of all, to my uh, left, your right, Dr. Virginia Molgard. She's extensive uh, Extension Family Life Specialist at the Department of Family Environment at Iowa State. And uh, also with us, Dr. Rosalie Husinga Norum, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Family Environment. Our first presenter today is Dr. Molgard. Virginia, glad you could be with us. We're talking with you today about um, the family as a system, or a family system, looking at stress, uh, not just stress on individual members of the family, but how stress uh, within the whole family system develops and uh, how it can be measured, how we look at it. I'll let you take over and uh, spend a few minutes talking about this research. Thank you, Roger. Often agencies focus on individual uh, uh, people, men and women, boys and girls. In a school, for instance, uh, the professionals who are working with a youngster, if there's a problem, 
are often concerned about that individual and if they do consider the family at all sometimes that's done uh, rather looking at the family uh, as a cause of the problem it's not just true in the schools a lot of other agencies like hospitals and treatment centers uh, people who are work working with individuals who have problems sometimes consider actually the family as the source of the problem comments such as uh, well no wonder Johnny has so many problems look at the family that he comes from end up placing blame on the family rather than looking at the family as sharing in the problems and sharing in the stress uh, the research that I'm reporting on here uh, suggests that whenever there are difficulties in the family like financial concerns uh, changes in a job relationship problems within a family the entire family experiences the stress and we can uh, see that within stress symptoms of the entire family uh, family therapists for many years have uh, seen the family functioning as a system and have noticed that whatever one family member does is affected by and in turn affects all the other members of the family but until recently the stress research has focused on uh, responses of an individual in the research that I'm reporting here we have scores on 13 different symptoms of stress for all of the members of the family uh, those symptoms include physical symptoms uh, like headaches and uh, uh, digestion problems, frequent colds and flu, and also psychological symptoms uh, like depression, anxiety, trouble sleeping, and behavioral symptoms such as use of alcohol, uh, use of drugs, and over or under eating. And so the research that I'm reporting on looks at a broad range of symptoms for all members of the family rather than just uh, an individual person. Uh, in a sense this comes as no news to us those of us who have worked with families have seen whole families reacting to difficult situations here in Iowa over the past several years of the rural crisis we have all seen uh, the kind the signs of stress in family members whereas the financial problems for uh, a farm are primarily adult problems problems of the mother and father and the grandparents whole families are experiencing the stress and we've done uh, some training extensive training here in Iowa with teachers and other professionals who work with youth letting them know that the children uh, are affected very definitely by the kinds of concerns and stress and loss that's going on uh, back home on the family farm we've all seen lists of stressful events in newspapers and magazines uh, events like uh, loss of a spouse, change in a job, uh, divorce, all the kinds of things that can happen to an individual or to a family. And yet, we really don't see a direct result of the changes that can occur. In other words, it isn't just that if those events happen, uh, an individual or a family necessarily will experience stress results. Uh, certainly when many changes occur within a family, uh, particularly changes that we don't want and over which we don't have much control, we're at a greater risk for stress-related illnesses. The more changes we experience, the more likely we are to be affected. But over 30 years of research on family stress tells us that the way fam families handle a pileup of stressful events certainly differs from one family to the next. Uh, coping, adjusting, managing change, whatever we call those uh, reactions to change makes a tremendous difference in how the family is affected. And so it's those things that, that happen there in the middle between the change or the life event and the outcome that makes all the difference for families. We have identified in the research that we're reporting here today a number of risk factors uh, that separate the families who do very well with chronic stress or uh, crisis events from the families who uh, tend to experience a great deal of uh, physical stress.
stress, physical stress signs, emotional stress, families in which relationships really become uh, at risk because of all the stressful events. Those risk factors uh, that predispose a family towards a greater experience of distress are self-esteem, uh, self-esteem of the parents, and also problem-solving ability, the ability to come up with various solutions for a problem. Another risk factor is whether or not the couple, the husband and the wife, are able to share their perception of what's going on in the family. Uh, if something happens, are both husband and wife able to see that as a difficulty and work on it together? On the other hand, families in which self-esteem is low and where parents are not able to come up with uh, various uh, new kinds of solutions to problems and where there isn't that shared perception uh, certainly experience more stress. Uh, an implication for professionals from these findings is that it's, it's of crucial importance not to place blame either overtly or subtly on the families of the, the clients that we're working with because by placing that blame uh, we are in fact uh, adding, adding to the burden of low self-esteem if the family is already struggling with that. Uh, if you're experiencing a lot of stress and difficulties within the family uh, and the professional that you're working with uh, seems to be blaming you for the problems or blaming you for the child's problems, uh, your self-esteem will suffer and things will go from bad to worse. A uh, couple of other characteristics that we've discovered make a tremendous difference in the way families react to stressful events, change in their lives, are family cohesion or closeness and family adaptability. Now closeness or cohesion is a, an important factor in families. Families can't function and become healthy if they don't have a sense of relating to each other, caring about each other, spending time together. But too much closeness, closeness or too much cohesion is uh, actually a detriment to families. And that's particularly true as young people reach adolescence where there's a greater and greater need for independence and privacy. If families are still pushing for the same kinds of cohesion and closeness that they had when the youngster was uh, 10 or 12 years old, there are going to be difficulties, both for the parents and for the youngsters themselves. It can be particularly difficult for young people uh, in their late teens to make that difficult transition away from the home towards independence, living on their own at college, out in the job world, if they haven't begun to develop some independence and separateness from their families. And it can be really painful for parents also if they haven't begun that separation earlier during the teen years. Another characteristic uh, that determines whether families will be able to adjust to change and not experience high levels of distress is adaptability or flexibility. Here again, it's really important for families to be able to change rules, change routines, change day-to-day -day functioning uh, as things come up within the family and as family members mature. But families certainly uh, can become too flexible. And in fact, if there is no sense of rules or structure uh, around the routines and the rules within a family, it feels more like chaos. And that's certainly not helpful for any family members. And so there are positive family characteristics that help a family become more invulnerable to the uh, negative effects of stress. Those characteristics that we've mentioned are self-esteem, uh, problem solving, the ability to come up with new solutions for new problems, and cohesion or closeness, and family adaptability. Okay, very good. Thanks very much. Uh, the uh, work that you're doing certainly uh, in this area is aimed at, at professionals. It is aimed at uh, treatment centers and so on uh, in the field. Am I right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, yet here in Iowa, we've also done a great deal of work with uh, uh, aimed at schools, aimed at churches, so that uh, there's some interaction and it really at a grass, 
at a grassroots level. Yes, and it helps really for families themselves to understand that uh, when something's going on, uh, for instance, relationship difficulties between the parents, that the children will be affected. And it's not a matter of feeling as, as the parent blame for that, that I've done a terrible thing mm -hmm. that's hurt my children, but rather just seeing the interrelationship uh, between all family members. Okay. We've got about five minutes that uh, we can talk. Rosalie, any, any questions that uh, you'd like to, to, to ask here? Well, I, I was wondering if, if we might talk a little bit more about what Virginia just mentioned as far as the interrelationships in the families as things come up. Uh, I think one of the things that parents sometimes wonder about is how much they should involve their children in talking about problems that come up. Um, are there things that, that parents sometimes need to keep secret mm -hmm. between the two of them? Yeah, are some things off limits? Are, so. are some things off limits for children? Um, you're saying that the research tells us that children do know what's going on and they are involved. And, um. In general, I think uh, what's important is for uh, family members to share concerns. And often parents have the idea that, you know, we don't want to bother the kids with this. They have, they have too many things to worry about now. I don't want to burden them with this. But we really see in families uh, with children all the way from, from infancy on up into the teenage years that children do know what's going on. And while sharing uh, details of particularly arguments or relationship difficulties uh, is probably not helpful for either children or teens, uh, sharing the feelings and to be able to say to children, yes, this is a problem. Uh, you know, Dad and I are worried about this. This is something we're struggling over, uh, but we are going to continue taking care of you, and you don't need to solve this yourself. But just really letting uh, the children know what they already, in a sense, know that there is a problem. Yeah. In a formal way or just through day-to-day uh, -day communication? I think sometimes since uh, parents aren't used to sharing a lot of things, most parents aren't used to on a daily basis sharing the mm -hmm. kind of difficulties I think probably parents uh, need to uh, take the time to say, you know, I need to sit down and talk with you about this. Now, that's a little different mm -hmm. if you're talking about a two-year-old uh, versus a school-age child. Uh, but probably a little more formally, unless you're one of the lucky families who shares feelings easily. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that happens, too, is that children tend to notice something's going on, and an immediate reaction is, it must be my fault. Mm -hmm. It must be because of something I'm doing uh, or something I should have done or uh, because I'm a bad kid or whatever. And that if parents can be reassuring to the children uh, times when there are problems going on that to say, you know, we, we are worried about some things, we are thinking about some things, but we want you to know, as Virginia says, we're going to keep taking care of you. And this isn't something that's your fault. Mm -hmm. So that it gives the pr child permission to give up some of that anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, really, what kids imagine uh, when they sense the stress and anxiety in the family, what they imagine is often much worse. And we've seen some, some uh, real poignant examples in the rural crisis of children who have had unrealistic, uh, terrible fears that are all out of proportion to what's really going on in the family. Yeah. It, in many cases, uh, especially with the, with the rural crisis, it's, a crisis says it's something that's going to, to get over, but mm -hmm. in many cases it doesn't get over, or there are some, some major changes. And I think uh, uh, that we need to, to make sure that all members of the family know this can be ongoing mm -hmm. and, and learn to live with, with crisis and problems. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I'd just like to pick up on what you said mm -hmm. because I, I think the point that, that a crisis is something that ends, but that doesn't mean that stress ends. Yeah. That, that what we need to be able to help families evaluate is how they can go from a crisis situation, which means coping isn't working very well, back to a situation where they can bring new resources into play and get back to coping, managing the stress. Because we, we can't maintain a crisis situation mm -hmm. forever. Nobody can do that. A system can't tolerate that. Yeah. We can do it for a short time, but then we need to get back to a situation where we can cope again. Okay. We are going to move back to Columbus, to Ohio State University. 
for a presentation of uh, further research. Again, uh, real briefly, uh, if you'd like to ask questions of Virginia or, or Rosalie, uh, the number is 1-800-255-2255, extension 1409, extension 1409. We have folks uh, ready to answer calls, and uh, we'll uh, be answering uh, your questions later on in the program. That's it for now from Ames, and we'll be back again uh, in just a few moments. Our first topic is critical needs of adolescent mothers. Dr. Karen Weddle will review the physical, social, psychological, and economic needs of this particular client group. First, here are some examples of those needs and a program that addresses them. issue full of deep-seated moral, religious, and ethical controversies. But teenage mothers and their children have many unmet financial, health, and educational needs. It's hard, very hard. I only go to four classes. And I get out at 1117. And they've provided a tutor for me the six weeks that I was out of school. I wanted to take computer lit and accounting. I just, I can't take it now. <laughs> I think it'd be nice to have a class for teenage moms and dads to talk about what, what's happening with themselves and to get out like their problems. And sometimes it's better to talk to a, another teenage parent because it's not what a teenager should have right now because they got school and they have their friends and they have to they have to live, <laughs> but if you have a baby, it ties you down a lot. One program making major strides towards helping adolescent mothers is GRADS. The objectives are main things that we try to accomplish in the class is to get them to graduate. We know that when they have a baby that that responsibility oftentimes interferes with them getting to school. And so we try in every way possible to see that they end up graduating. So we give a lot of attention to parenting techniques and, and to dealing with stress so that they know how to deal with stress and how to uh, avoid child abuse. The other objective of the program is to make sure that they have some direction in their life so that they know where they're going in the future. Um, what can they do that will help them to earn a living that will take care of them and their babies because many of my students, the majority, are not married and the reality is that they're going to be supporting their, their child and themselves. My biggest concern right now is that we're losing a lot of students um, who are dropping out of school simply because they don't have child care. It would help many, many teenagers to graduate and go on with their lives if they had a place to leave their babies that they could trust and know the baby was being well taken care of. And I guess that's one of my biggest concerns right now is the child care area. Action for children. I love them. All right. right. That's a good start. Action for children is a community resource that you could use, isn't it? Innovative programs such as grads and traditional programs like WIC and Title 20 are a step in the right direction, but they are just beginning to meet the socioeconomic needs of adolescent parents. Good morning, I'm Karen Weddle, and I'm here to talk about the critical needs of adolescent mothers. Ruth, whenever adolescent childbearing and adolescent pregnancy is mentioned, it's always very controversial and very sensitive. People have to confront themselves with personal, ethical, moral, and social issues. While all of these are important, the focus of this presentation is on the risk of adolescent pregnancy and childbearing and the various ways that public policy can address the unmet needs of adolescent mothers. The re research findings to be presented here have come from numerous national studies on adolescent pregnancy and childbearing and are thus generalizations. It's important to mention that because there are some adolescent mothers and their children who will not fall into these categories of risk. I'll first begin by discussing the health risk of adolescent mothers and their children. Approximately one million adolescent girls become pregnant in the U.S. every year and nearly half give birth. The majority of these births are to unmarried mothers, nearly half of whom are under the age of 18. The health risk to the young mother and her infant are of great concern. The maternal mortality rate of teenage mothers is higher than any other age group except for women over 40. 
For those adolescent mothers who survived the birth, the rates associated with pregnancy, such as toxemia and prolonged labor, are also very much higher. The babies of teenage mothers are far more likely to die in the first year of life than babies of mothers over 20. The infant or teen mothers are also more likely to be born premature or to be of low birth weight. Low birth weight is a major cause of neurological deficits, including mental retardation, birth defects, and a host of other serious childhood diseases. Thus, prevention of low birth weight infants among adolescents is a major health concern and should be a priority of public policy. There are also many educational risks and consequences of adolescent childbearing, and it is a major concern. Most research shows that mothers who give birth before 18 are far less likely to graduate from high school. Obviously, without a high school diploma, adolescent mothers are in an extremely disadvantaged position to compete for employment opportunities and to provide self-sufficient environments for their children. Children of adolescent mothers also suffer educational risk. They are more likely to repeat a grade upon entering school and more likely to show intellectual deficits, resulting in lower IQ scores and academic achievement scores. Poor and or incomplete education of teen mothers, coupled with the fact that adolescent mothers have 50% more births than late child bearers, all add up to less income for teen mothers and their children. For this reason then, adolescent mothers are more likely to be AFDC recipients than mothers who delay childbearing. A 1981 study showed that $4.7 billion in AFDC payments went to mothers who gave birth in their teens. Thus, the educational risk of teen parenthood has a cyclical impact on the economic and social well-being of adolescent mothers and their children. One of the major factors contributing to the adolescent parent dropout rate is the unmet need for infant care. Statistics indicate that over half of all children being reared by adolescent mothers are in need of child care services. Most mothers would like to continue their education, but they are unable to do so due to lack of daycare or lack of money to pay for babysitting and or daycare services. A nationwide study indicated that the most significant unmet need for teenage mothers and their babies are facilities, funds, and staff to provide infant care. Adolescent mothers who marry are also at greater risk for divorce. Adolescent mothers who married and gave birth between the years of 14 to 17 years of age are three times more likely to be separated or divorced than mothers over 20. Another risk issue is abortions. Abortions also pose risk for adolescent mothers the number of abortions for teen mothers rose dramatically from 1970 through 1980, but appears to have stabilized in the last few years, representing about 28% of all induced abortions. But pregnant teenagers are more likely to delay abortion, and abortions performed at later times in pregnancy result in greater risk of complications. The greatest risk is cervical trauma, which may increase the risk of complications with future pregnancies. All of these risks simply illustrate the critical unmet needs of adolescent mothers. It is important to address these needs now because these risks tend to be generational and cyclical. The primary unmet need is a program of retention in the public school system. Adolescent mothers need daycare services, courses in parenting, child development, and vocational training in order to graduate, to obtain gainful employment, and to provide a good environment for their children. Research shows that when these services are available, the adolescent mother is more likely to graduate and less likely to receive welfare benefits. Adolescent mothers also need better access to health care facilities and family planning clinics. Family planning clinics have been very effective in preventing second pregnancies during adolescence, which is critical because adolescent mothers are at risk for becoming pregnant again during their teen years. Finally, Ruth, and probably most important, adolescent mothers need family life education, not sex education. 
Sex education when taught in American public schools is generally limited to sexually transmitted diseases and physiological changes. Education, in order to be effective and preventative, needs to be comprehensive, focusing on family life options, such as transitions to parenthood and the responsibilities and consequences of early parenting, such as transitions to the labor force and the preparation required to be self-sufficient in today's society, such as family planning and the responsibilities and consequences associated with early sexual activity and the preventative measures thereof, and such as marriage and family dynamics and the responsibilities associated with the multiple roles of being a wife, a mother, a breadwinner, and having a tremendous commitment to family life. Essentially, family life education is greatly needed so that adolescents have a knowledge base from which they can broaden and expand their life options and not limit them. Karen, you've beautifully outlined a very critical, prominent social issue of our time, the needs of adolescent mothers. What about the needs of adolescent fathers? Well, Ruth, of late we've seen a lot of research and attention being devoted to adolescent fatherhood. We're finding that adolescent fathers are also at need, in, in great need, and there are many risks that confront them as well particularly educational risk, they are also less likely to complete high school. And thus the impact of the incompletion of high school results in less earning ability and less income for the family. Adolescent fathers also often express needs to get more involved with the, with the child and the mother. But often they just don't know how. So I think the whole concept of family life education directed towards both young boys and young girls would be helpful in ameliorating the problems of adolescent parenthood. Thank you very much for that wealth of information, Karen. Okay. Our next topic is the hospitalization experience of adolescents. Our presenter is George Pellerite, a master's degree candidate in our Department of Family Relations and Human Development. His study focused on how the experience of hospitalization for adolescents affected their self-esteem and locus of control. George, we're looking forward to hearing your findings. Thank you, Ruth. Good morning. Before I begin with my part of the presentation this morning, I do want to mention who the two principal investigators were for this piece of research, of which I was one of the participants. They are Dr. Rosemary Bolig, Associate Professor in the Department of Family Relations and Human Development here at Ohio State University, and Dr. Robert Brown, also Associate Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at Ohio State University and the Director of the Outpatient Adolescent Clinic at Children's Hospital here in Columbus, where we collected this data. Hospitalization and illness uh, are regarded as universal stressors by most social scientists. Accompanying this hospitalization is usually feelings of depersonalization and a lack of control. Now, of the many different aspects of being in the hospital that researchers have looked at in the past, the one that seems to have received the most empirical support has been that of chronological age at the time of hospitalization. What researchers have found is that the young child seems to show the most distress not only during the time that they're in the hospital, but also immediately following this period. Adolescents, on the other hand, are often seen as being much less vulnerable. This is partly due to the fact that there have been very, very few studies that have looked specifically at the adolescent patient. Being neither children nor adults, the adolescents are often included in studies of how children react to being in the hospital and are used as the upper age range of childhood, or they might be included in studies looking at adults' reactions and used as the lower end of the, the age scale. Out of this need to have more specific information on adolescents, this piece of research set out to focus in on those adolescents between the ages of 13 and 19 and how they react to illness and hospitalization. Specifically, the way that the locus of control and self-esteem are affected by their time in being in the hospital. For this study then, we collected data on 115 adolescents, ages 13 and 19, who attended an adolescent outpatient clinic at Children's Hospital here in Columbus. They were asked to participate and fill out a paper and pencil questionnaire while they were waiting to see the doctor. The adolescents were selected based on the four categories that will be shown on your screens. These categories were those adolescents 
who had never been hospitalized, those adolescents hospitalized prior to the age of 12, those hospitalized after the age of 12, and those adolescents who had had a hospitalization both prior to and after the age of 12. Our initial analysis of this data found that adolescents hospitalized at the various times were not significantly different in either self-esteem or locus of control. Now this is not to say that there were no differences at all and that the groups looked exactly the same, but that the differences that we did find between the groups uh, were not that great or significant enough to, to really point out any great differences. However, what we did find were that adolescents who had been hospitalized had experienced more critical events during the 12-month period preceding their admission to the hospital than those adolescents who had not been hospitalized. In other words, in the time period prior to admission, they were asked to, to list, to, to check off uh, on a number of different events that might or might not have occurred to them. And those adolescents who had had a hospitalization did experience more of these events than those adolescents who had never had a hospitalization. What this really means, then, is that as the number of the crisis events increased, the adolescent's locus of control tended to become more external. Now, this was found to be true for the first three of our age groups uh, that we looked, uh, of hospitalization groups that we looked at, but was not found for those adolescents who had been hospitalized both before the age of 12 and after the age of 12. Now, there might be several reasons for our findings uh, in this area. One of them is probably that the low socioeconomic status of this particular clinic sample might partially account for the differences uh, related to having experienced hospitalization uh, or by having experienced hospitalization at the different ages. We do know that poor t children tend to be hospitalized more often and they do ha tend to have fewer psychosocial resources available to them to deal with the experience. However, hospitalization might not be seen by these adolescents as being a critical uh, life event or a critical stressor to them because there are so many other things going on concurrently in their life. In other words, perhaps that the overall quality of the life of these adolescents was so poor that hospitalization was not sufficiently negative to make a difference. Uh, it might even be possible that for some of these uh, adolescents that we interviewed, their self-esteem self and sense of control might have been enhanced by being in the hospital and experiencing an illness, uh, thereby statistically negating those adolescents who had a negative experience in the hospital. What we hope to have accomplished by this uh, beginning of a line of research uh, is to advance the knowledge in the field on adolescents' response to illness and hospitalization, uh, and to have this serve as a basis for further study by uh, not only uh, ourselves and people with the, here at Ohio State, but also for other researchers around the country to begin to focus in on this very critical period of adolescence and to have information that we can use to, to uh, build on for further research and study. Extremely interesting, George. The two factors or variables that you studied were self-esteem and locus of control. Could you explain briefly what each of those means? I'll be happy to, Ruth. In a very general way, uh, self-esteem is something that we all uh, probably do understand, but the definition, uh, one definition would be uh, the degree to which a person feels either positive or negative attitudes towards him or herself. Now, there are two aspects of self-esteem, the, uh, the two extremes, high self-esteem and low self-esteem. Uh, a high self-esteem person is one that has self-respect and considers himself or herself a person of worth. At the other extreme, low, uh, we have those persons who lack respect for themselves and consider themselves unworthy or inadequate and otherwise uh, perhaps uh, deficient in some ways as a person. Uh, with locus of control, we again find two parts. I mentioned in the study the idea of external locus of control. Uh, a person who exhibits this externality or external locus of control is one that believes that events that are happening to them and around them 
are not contingent upon their own actions, but upon luck or fate uh, or powerful others. They're, they're very passive in this regard and are simply just reacting to things around them. A person who has internal locus of control uh, is a person uh, who believes uh, that the events that are happening to them around them are contingent upon their own behavior, that indeed they do have control of their life uh, and control the events that are happening to them. Very interesting. You also use the term critical life stressors or critical life events. Would you elaborate a bit on what that means? Mm -hmm. These are really uh, events that all of us experience in normal day life, and we might not think of them or see them as being critical uh, or stressful. Uh, examples of the that the uh, that the adolescents were asked to to check either yes or no on were things just as simple and basic as changing schools. Uh, school districts or perhaps uh, changing grades in school, father losing a job, uh, getting promotion, parents divorcing, death of a parent or relative, uh, death of a close friend, uh, the kind of everyday activities that are happening to us that if uh, the right combination occur uh, can be seen as being stressful or if we lack sufficient resources to deal with these uh, events that could be stressful. And these resources do not have to be anything from, from outside the individual or outside the family. Uh, they can just, uh, if, regarding loss of uh, income through loss of a job or death of uh, a parent, uh, is there sufficient income just to get through that period uh, while the family makes an adjustment to this loss of income? Uh, for some people, if there is, and support of family and friends, it's not really a stressful uh, incident at all uh, in the sense that we're, we're considering it here. Uh, for others, it could be very devastating and very stressful and just compound issues and lead to, to further deterioration of the family. It seems then rather than any one individual factor precipitating a crisis or uh, precipitating the difficulty, it's accumulation of factors, the, the total uh, amount of things that are happening in the life. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm, that's very true. A number of researchers have looked at this kind of additive effect, as, as you mentioned here, the multiplicative effect of different events upon the individual that perhaps as they build up in some period of time uh, that suddenly a crisis evolves or it does then become stressful and that's what we were also looking at and we'll do some further analysis of the data to see exactly perhaps which events seemed more likely to be occurring uh, with these adolescents prior to their admission to the hospital and exactly how many and is there a critical time period or a critical number of them or certain ones perhaps that stand out more than others. Uh, so we have all of that data to, to look at to try and, and, and get a better idea of, of where we stand with this research and then to go on and look at things in more detail. That would be very helpful as we work towards supporting adolescents and, and uh, optimizing their development. George and Karen, thank you very much. Now it's time to go back to Iowa State for their second research presentation. Back to you, Roger. Thanks very much, Dr. Canoni. Uh, we would uh, once again like to note that uh, you can call us, and we hope that you do if you have questions. Again, the telephone number for uh, anyone in or outside Iowa to ask questions here is 1-800-255-2255, extension 1409. And we continue to look at uh, the family and look inside the family. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Rosalie Husing and Norum. And uh, we're talking uh, about something that uh, I can relate to. You know, I, I know that most of what we're doing today is, is, is for professionals, uh, for folks in the field, um, teachers, uh, social workers, and so on, uh, extension specialists. But uh, as a father of uh, teenagers, uh, all of what we talk about is, uh, is really uh, uh, something that I can relate to. Uh, we talked about crises in the family uh, with, uh, with Virginia, and Rosalie, uh, when we talk about daily hassles, uh, if there aren't daily hassles, I begin to worry. What's a daily hassle? <laughs> What's a daily hassle? Well, as you said, you, you're a father and you have a family, and I'm a mother and I have a family, and one of the things that got me interested in the whole idea of daily hassles, which are what they sound mm -hmm. like they are, the kinds of relationship issues and tasks that a family has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I got interested in that whole area because of some of the things I experienced in my own family and in my own life. 
noticing that the times when stress was most difficult to manage and most difficult to deal with were those times when the day-to-day things were not getting taken care of or when the day-to-day relationships were causing the most problems. And that happens to all of us from time to time. And it becomes an important idea when we go back to the issue that we talked about earlier when Virginia was talking about families and stress and health and the question of crisis versus stress management. And I'd I'd like to talk about daily hassles a little bit in relationship to that. As I said earlier, we can't maintain a crisis situation indefinitely. Either the system totally deteriorates or it finds a way to resolve the crisis to an extent that which we can get back to managing. And in my own life and then the research that we've designed and completed does indeed, which is always nice for a researcher, support that issue that the daily hassles are a big part of that. That if we're able to cope with those and to manage them and in fact to have them be a positive influence in our life, it's easier to deal with the larger life events that we just heard talked about uh, by Dr. Pellet. Right from Ohio State, things like divorce, uh, changing schools, and the list of stressors that he mentioned. That in combination, dealing with those, we have to deal with day-to-day issues, both relationships and tasks and, and outside influences. So that's why daily hassles are important to include into the research equation, if you want to think about that. So as part of a nine-state regional project on families in the middle years and stress and coping, we included a section studying how families dealt with daily hassles. The daily hassles that we looked at, we looked at really on a continuum from positive influence of relationships and day-to-day issues to a negative influence. So families were asked to respond in terms of are these things positive in your life or are they negative? And of course in the middle it could be neutral. And some of the things we found out I think are kind of interesting. One of the things that uh, we looked at was which issues were most positive for families and I think we can see that now on the screen. And we looked at the differences between men and women. And you'll see on the screen the five most stressful aspects of day-to-day routine for women and for men. You'll notice at the top of the list we see ex-spouse. Now, there were not a large portion of our sample that had ex-spouses, but for those people who did, these were reported as the most stressful aspect of the day-to-day routine if they were maintaining contact. And I think that's easy to understand in terms of some of the child care issues, uh, financial issues. There are a number of factors there that could be very stressful. The second one was finances. And again, I suspect most of us can relate to that in our own lives, that when, when there are financial problems, financial issues, and they're part of the day-to-day routine that we're trying to deal with, that that adds a lot to our overall stress level. You notice by the time we get to the third most stressful aspect, we begin to pick up a difference between men and women. And probably a lot of us won't be terribly surprised to find that household chores were much more stressful on a day-to-day basis for women than they were for men, although they are number five for men as well. Um, Errands come out number three for males, uh, number four for females, and you'll see time use on both of those lists. Uh, I find it interesting that the top five are the same for the husbands and wives in in the sample that we looked at. So that was one of the things that we found out and some of the general differences. Let's look a little more at what some of the differences are. These were the categories for wives uh, in terms, when when we looked a little more in detail, and we looked at categories. These were some of the categories that came up for wives as, a, as the most stressful. And I wonder if we could look at the ones for husbands as well. And you'll notice that there were some, some differences there that 
uh, again, husbands tended to rank work issues related to day-to-day -day stressful, day-to-day uh, -day stressors or hassles as, as more important in their lives. Um, and this doesn't reflect that our sample was made up of non-working wives because a major portion of our wives were working wives. So those were some of the differences that we identified as, as far as gender differences are concerned. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what this means for professionals and, for that matter, for families themselves. As we work with families, we need to be aware that it's not just the crisis events that are important. Those are important, but the day-to-day -day issues are also an important factor. And we need to think about whether families are in need of some support, a temporary provision of support for dealing with these day-to-day -day issues. Some examples of that might be uh, a family that would need some temporary child care help or some temporary help with some of the household chores. One of the things I think that we very well know in our folk wisdom is that when a crisis occurs, people gather around, and what do they do? One of the things they do is, is they bring food, they offer to help out with some of the day-to-day -day tasks. So we've known that in our folk wisdom for a very long time, and our research indicates that that, that really was wisdom and that we need to be aware of that as professionals, that sometimes that's an important factor. We need to be able to recognize when the crisis situation occurs, and if we recognize that some of these day-to-day -day things aren't getting taken care of, that can be helpful to us in um, recognizing that this really is a crisis and that we need to be moving in to doing some crisis intervention uh, things. When I think of crisis intervention, I think of something that's short-term, I think of something that is primarily designed to help the person or the family get back to a coping situation, being able to handle things. So we've, we've looked at daily hassles. We've, we have found that they are an important factor. They help us explain more than just looking at life events. And um, maybe you have some questions that we can spend a few minutes on. One of the questions I wanted to ask uh, relating to the the daily stresses, mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, maybe for my own uh, information, but in, in in a personal experience in mm -hmm. my own family, w one of the major stresses is is interaction with uh, with youngsters. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that this was not listed specifically in this. Was that just not part of the research in this case? No, that was part of the research. One of the relationships that we asked about was the relationship with children, and what we found was that that was reported overall as a very positive influence in people's lives, but that when there were problems there, that was an important factor. So that, and this was more positive for women. Women were, were more likely to report that their relationship with children on a day-to-day -day basis was a positive thing in their, in their life, but men were also likely to report that was more positive than negative influence. So I don't know if part of what we're picking up on there is that you don't tell people that your children mm -hmm. are negative influence in your life. Uh, that may be, but uh, it also may be that, that overall, and if I asked you this question, overall would you say your children are more positive in influence in your life than negative? Probably most of us would say yes. I think that's right. And again, it's a stress, but it's mm -hmm. a positive that's stress. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or we're willing to pay the price. Mm -hmm. Virginia, any interaction with this? Certainly, uh, uh, as you look at uh, family systems, this, all, of course, all in interrelates. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the question of uh, the effects on all members of the mm -hmm. family. Let's say mom and dad are, have a lot of concerns over work issues or household chores. Um, how is that picked up in the rest of the family system then? Well, I think I'll respond to the household chores one. I, I think there probably aren't very mom, many moms and dads who don't have concerns over getting household chores done. And not only are the chores themselves part of the daily hassle, but the issues that arise around getting the chores done are part of the daily hassles. And so it, it becomes a compounding thing. And I think children, you, you talked about parents maybe not directly 
dealing with issues with their parents. I suspect this is one of the ones that gets dealt with, while not maybe always effectively, pretty directly <laughs> with children so that they're pretty much aware of that. The work thing, I, I believe, is one of the issues that parents sometimes need to be more open about with their children. The children may not be aware of the stress that their parents are experiencing in a work situation. And it might be an example of one of those times when they feel like it's something they're doing. And if they could understand that, no, it's something that's going on at work, I'm worried about it, there are problems, that that might be helpful. Okay, I'd like to take a, a moment just to ask a question from the audience, and we appreciate mm -hmm. your calls. This one comes directly to you, Rosalie, okay. from, from Ohio. They wanted to, you to define the time, I, I guess it's time use, mm -hmm. and what's the sample size? Mm -hmm. Okay, this, I'll, first I'll define the time use. The time, we did not go into detail in terms of looking at specific ways people use their time. We simply asked them the question whether time use was a day-to-day -day stressor for them whether the way they used their time was more positive in their life or more negative. And so that's not a detailed time use question. Uh, the overall sample size is about 1,900 families in nine states. Okay. And then f from Iowa, a question, uh, what's the, the whole list of daily hassles? I don't know if you have that. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, I, have, I think I have 10 of 13 here. We uh, ask questions about these were the items that we asked about. Uh, finances, household chores, errands, time use, in-laws, pets, meals, siblings, neighbors, ex-spouses, uh, transportation, uh, and I think there's one that I'm forgetting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Virginia, it's interesting to me as uh, I listen to Rosalie finish w and talk about support systems that during the farm crisis in Iowa, some rather informal and then formal support systems developed. Um, uh, clubs of, uh, of uh, farm wives, for instance, or farm husband and wives that, uh, that gathered a at a regular time, uh, made rules just to talk about these things and act as a, a support system for individuals and for each other. And it, for people who did participate in those kinds of groups, we call them self-help mm -hmm. groups, uh, we found that it did make a big difference to them in two different ways. One way was just the emotional support of feeling that someone else cares and someone else is uh, concerned about me and what's going on with me. But also another kind of support in which individuals got specific information about uh, uh, legal advice, financial advice, uh, how to apply for food stamps, uh, where the local food pantry is. So both kinds of support uh, came to people through these groups. Yeah. And here in Iowa, we've done a lot with paraprofessionals uh, formally, uh, in extension, uh, both for uh, business counseling, uh, farm business counseling, and also for family counseling um, in cases where folks are uh, perhaps uncomfortable going to a uh, professional agency, at least to begin with. We have something to kind of soften that, let them go to uh, uh, paraprofessionals, uh, in many cases uh, connected with extension, that leads them to uh, the needed help, whether it be a uh, social worker or uh, perhaps a real, s right now, crisis counseling, that sort of thing. We've been uh, uh, more and more successful as the months and years of the rural crisis have gone by in training peer listeners and peer helpers. And those groups have been enormously successful, both to the people who get the training and participate in the program themselves and to the people that they help. All the individuals who are not willing uh, or able to uh, call mental health workers or seek those professional contacts but will talk to a neighbor or a friend. They've been enormously helpful. Okay. And some of the hotline uh, calls yes. too. We've, I've been doing a little bit of work just recently trying to summarize some of the things that have been, some of the calls that have come in over the last few years on mm -hmm. our, our farm crisis hotline. and. Uh, um, that's been an important resource and providing some of the support that we've been talking about. Uh, we have one additional question uh, specifically for, for Rosalie. Uh, again, a better description of your sample, of single parents, new or married, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Our sample was identified specifically to study uh, stress and coping in fa intact families in the middle years, and we identified that 
with the parameters of the wife being between 35 and 55 and there being at least one child living in the home because we were interested as a longitudinal study over a three-year period and we were interested as in studying the launching process as one of the, the stressors and so that's how the sample was defined uh, and we did not include single parents that that's an additional uh, piece of the research that we hope to do in the future okay anything else uh, we'll send it back to Ohio State if not and we'll have a chance to uh, to talk a bit more in a few moments and answer some more questions from you again we appreciate you very much your interaction with us uh, that's what makes this type of, uh, of thing very exciting for us and I think very useful uh, an uplink uh, uh, used as a tool to reach you uh, from a couple places in the country we're at the Iowa State University in Ames Iowa and uh, we're going to return now to Columbus Ohio for another presentation welcome back our next topic is factors related to adolescent suicide our presenter is Donna Quick a doctoral candidate in the Department of Family Relations and Human Development. Donna, your research focuses on a most serious issue prevalent today and we're looking forward to hearing the results of your study. Thank you, Ruth. The statistics are staggering. About 5,000 adolescents and young adults committed suicide last year, an average of 13 per day. The present suicide rate among adolescents is about twice as high as 10 years ago and three times as high as 20 years ago. Suicide is, in fact, the second leading cause of death among 15 to 24-year-olds. Many researchers contend that suicidal behaviors are highly prevalent among young people and